What's up my stats stars, Michael Princhuk here, ready to start helping you prepare for the AP Statistics exam in May. In this video, I'm gonna walk you through some multiple choice questions that deal with exploring one variable data, which came out of unit one. Now, this particular topic covers around 15 to 23% of all the multiple choice questions on the exam. Now, I'm gonna be walking you through some questions that were on a previous exam that has been released to the public. Now, you're not gonna see these exact same questions word for word on the exam, I promise you that, but all of the big concepts and key ideas in these problems, you're more than likely gonna see on the AP exam this year. All right, let's get ready to take a look at them now. Before we start examining some multiple choice questions out of exploring one variable data, let's take a look at two formulas on the formula sheet that you possibly might need for questions in this section. Now here they are. The first on the left here is the formula for the mean, and on the right is the formula for the standard deviation of a sample. Now, Honestly, you're probably never going to need these formulas. I hope that you already know how to find the mean of a sample of data. You add them all together and divide by how many you have. And the standard deviation is a little bit more confusing for the formula, but overall not too, too bad. But the point is, is your calculator could do all of this for you. All you have to do is enter your data into a list and then run a one variable stats for that list and you'll get the mean and the standard deviation very easy. So although they do provide these formulas to you, you're probably never going to need them on the exam. All right, let's start taking a look at some multiple choice questions. All right, this first one says, of the following dot plots, dot plots, which represents the set of data that has the greatest standard deviation. So the first thing we have to understand is what is the definition of standard deviation? It's how far typical data is from the mean. So all of these dot plots are symmetric. I mean, they're all evenly balanced. So the mean is going to be right smack dab in the middle. So now we're looking at the one that has the greatest standard deviation. So which one has the most points that are far from the mean? Because again, standard deviation is a measurement of how far data is from the mean. And a greater standard deviation means more points are far from the mean. So I'm going to go with B. B is going to have the greatest standard deviation because the distance typically for each point from the mean is the greatest. Most points are way to the left or way to the right. That means they're going to have a really big standard deviation. Whereas all the other choices has some points near the mean that's going to allow the standard deviation to be slightly lower than B, which has pretty much all of the points far from the mean. All right, in this one, we're asked or we're looking at a random sample of 374 United States pennies that was collected, and the age of each penny was determined according to the box plot below. What is the approximate interquartile range of the data? So here you need to remember that the interquartile range, IQR, is your third quartile minus your first quartile. So when we're looking at these box plots, the quartiles are the edges of the box. The median is the line that's um, somewhere in between in the middle of the box. So now if we're kind of estimate, so we're going to do a good job estimating. So I'm estimating that this lower quartile, the, the lower of the two quartiles, quarter one, is probably around three. Again, that's my rough estimate. And the upper quartile or quarter three looks just below 20, so I'll say 19. So the IQR is going to be 19 minus 3, which gives me an IQR of 16. Choice C is going to be the correct choice there. So pretty simple question as long as you remember how to find the IQR. All right, in this problem, the histogram above shows the number of minutes needed by 45 students to finish playing a computer game. Which of the following statements is correct? Now, first, we've got to remember how to interpret a histogram. So histograms are set up into bins. So this bin is for any student that finished from one up to three minutes. Most of these histograms are left-handed, so we equal the number on the left, we go up to the number on the right. So that's one minute all the way to 2.999999 minutes. Um, one kid fell into that bin, one kid fell from three to five, and so forth. So now if I'm reading the questions, it all talks about the shape of the distribution. So I really hope you remember shape. Well, when we see the majority of the data on the right-hand side and less and less and less and less and less data to the left, that is skewed to the left. So there is our choice B there for skewed to the left. Pretty easy question as long as you know your different shapes. All right, and this next question says, which of the following could be the median of the waiting times and minutes? So these are the amount of waiting times people had to wait at a dentist office for a sample of 175 patients. Once again, we see about 80 people waited from zero up to five minutes and so forth. We definitely see that the distribution is skewed to the right, but the question's not asking about that, it's asking about the median. Now there is no formula to find median, but there is a formula to find the location of the median. You take your sample size plus one and divide by two. Again, I wanna emphasize, this does not tell you what the median is, it tells you the location of the median. So if I do 175 plus 1, which is obviously 176, 
divide by two, I get 88. That means that the median is at the 88th spot when the data is in order. So there are 80 people from zero to five. So the 88th person must be somewhere in this bin. Now, this bin contains about 50 people. So after that bin, I'm obviously way past 88. So the 88th person putting the data in order from lowest to highest is somewhere in this bin five to 10. The only answer that could possibly make sense because it's between five and 10 would be choice B, 7.25 minutes. Now, in terms of how did they get 7.25? Well, if, if I didn't have these choices, all I know is that it's between five and 10. I could not tell exactly that it was at 7.25. The median is not necessarily going to be the dead center of that. It doesn't have to be at all. It could be any value in that bin. We don't know what those values are. So we just know it's in that bin. But based on these choices, the only one that would make sense is choice B. All right, this question says data was collected on the amount in dollars that individual customers spent on dinner in an Italian restaurant. The quartiles for these data are given below. So they give us Q1, Q2, Q3. Which of the following statements must be true for these customers? All right, now before I dive too far into that, let's quickly talk about how the quarters separate our data. So if here's all my data, a terrible straight line here, but this is my min to my max. Okay, so the second quartile is right smack dab in the middle. That's also known as the median. Now that is 50% below it and 50% above it. Guaranteed. All right, then we have Q1. Q1 is the middle of the bottom half of the data, which is going to mean that there's 25% below it, 75% above it. Q3 is the middle of the upper half of data. That means there's 75% below it, 25% above it. So now that we have a quick understanding of that, we could now look at these choices. All right. A says at least half the customers spent less than or equal to $44.20 and at least half spent greater than $44.20. That's exactly true. The median is $44.27. 50%, that's half, is below. 50% is above. That's going to be your median for sure. So there's going to be our correct answer. But let's make sure we read the other ones and understand why they're wrong. B says 75% of the customers spent between $36.00. 27 and 58.97. That's Q1 and Q3. In between your quartiles is 50% of data, not 75%. C says 25% of the customers spent less than or equal to 58.97 and the remaining 75% spent greater than or equal to 58.97. Well, 58.97 is Q3 right here. There's 75% below it, 25% above it. So they got it backwards. They said 25% below it, 75 above it. It's completely backwards. Uh, D says the mean amount is uh, is about $44.27. There's no way I could calculate the mean with just this information. To calculate the mean, I would need to know all of my data values, and I simply just do not. Finally, a majority of customers spent $44.27. Again, that is not what the median is telling us. The median is not telling us what the majority of customers did. The median is just a number, a value that is 50% above and 50% below. So if these choices, the only one that makes sense is A. Next up, the weight of an adult male grizzly bear living in the wild in the continental of the United States is approximately normally distributed. Ooh, I love normal. I love normal. Okay. With a mean of 500 pounds and a standard deviation of 50 pounds. The weight of adult female grizzly bears is approximately normally distributed as well with the mean of 300 and a standard deviation of 40. Okay. Now, this is one of those problems where there's lots of numbers. So, I'd like to kind of separate things. So, first, we're talking about male grizzly bears. It tells us the mean is 500. And the standard deviation is 50. Really organizing myself here is going to pay off. For female grizzly bears, the mean for females is 300 pounds. And the standard deviation for females is 40 pounds. Okay. Approximately, what would the weight of a female grizzly bear with the same standardized score, Z-score, as a male grizzly bear with a weight of 530 pounds? So I want us to figure out if we have a male grizzly bear at 530 pounds, what would be an equivalent Z-score for that female? Okay, so first we got to figure out the Z-score for this male grizzly bear. Okay, this male grizzly bear is 530 pounds, so the formula for Z-score is to subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation. Okay, grab your calculator and do that work if you need to. That's going to give us a Z-score of 0.6. That means that this particular grizzly bear is 0.6 standard deviations above the mean. So just a little bit above the mean. But what I want to figure out is an equivalent 
female weight. So I'm going to take that z-score and I'm going to set it equal to the z-score formula for females. But again, I'm going to put a giant F here because I don't know the weight that's going to get that. I have to solve for it. But I would subtract the mean of 300 and divide by the standard deviation of 40. So now I just got to solve for the weight for that female grizzly bear that would produce that z-score. So I'm going to take the 0 0.6. The first thing I'm going to do is multiply over the 40. Hopefully you guys have a little bit of algebra base here. Then I'm going to add 300 to that to get the weight of this female bear. So grab your calculator, 0 0.6 times 40 plus 300 gives me a female weight of 324 pounds. And there it is, choice B. That's going to produce a female grizzly bear that, in terms of z-scores, is equivalent to that male grizzly bear of 530 pounds. All right, and this problem says for a sample of 42 rabbits, okay, so I'm dealing with a sample, the mean weight is five pounds. So since this is a sample, I'm gonna use X bar as my mean, five pounds. And the standard deviation, that's gonna be S, of my sample is three pounds. Which of the following is most likely true about the weights of the rabbits in this sample? Okay, I know the mean, I know the standard deviation. That means most of these rabbits are somewhere between two and eight pounds because most data is within one standard deviation of the mean. Now, let's see here. A says the distribution of the weights is approximately normal because the sample size is 42. Therefore, the central limit theorem applies. Okay, that that's the central limit theorem deals with sampling distributions. We're talking about this one sample. We're not talking about all possible samples. We're talking about this one sample. So I like what A says, but it's incorrect because it's talking about sampling distributions and, and that's unit five where we're talking about many, 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 many samples and how does our sample fit into all those other samples? And we're just not doing that in this problem. We're just talking about our one particular sample. We're not looking at all possible sample means. All right, B says the distribution of weights is approximately normal with a standard deviation is less than the mean. Um, I mean, okay, we're going to talk about the fact that it's not normal in a minute, but you, nothing's normal because the standard deviation is less than the mean. Like, that's not a requirement to be normal. That has never been taught to you. Just because the standard deviation is less than the mean doesn't tell you anything about it, shape. All right, C says the distribution of weights is skewed to the right. D says the distribution is skewed to the left. And E says the distribution of weights is a median that is greater than the mean. Okay, well, um, the only way I would know that is if I knew the shape. If I knew the shape, I could know the median and how it fits and how it compares to the mean. So, I mean, that's, that's a maybe, but I kind of have to figure out its shape first. So, I don't think it's B because, again, it might be normal, but I'm actually going to tell you in a minute that it's not. But I don't like this explanation. Like, just because the standard deviation is less than the mean has nothing to do with it. All right, so let's talk about if it's skewed left or skewed right because those are going to kind of be our main choices here. And then that could also help us understand if E is even correct as well. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to make a number line. On that number line, I'm going to put the mean of five. Now, if I go up one standard deviation, that takes me to eight. If I go down one standard deviation, that takes me to two. Okay, great. The majority of the rabbits in their sample are going to be in that range. But I could also go up two standard deviations. That's going to be taking me up to 11. And that's going to be taking me down to negative one. And that's where I have a problem because a rabbit cannot weigh less than zero pounds. It can't even weigh zero. But even something really close to zero is going to be extremely unlikely. So the point is, is that we kind of get cut off right here at zero because nothing down here is even possible. So that's going to cause us to be skewed to the right. Because basically, it, to be normal, you have to be able to go two, even three standard deviations in both directions and still grab some of the data. If you want to be approximately normal, you got to be able to go three standard deviations in both directions and grab even a small amount of data. But the problem is, once I go two standard deviations below the mean, I, I get down into negatives, which is for this particular problem is impossible. So that's why this is going to be skewed to the right which means that the, you know, and again, the, the reason makes sense here is because the least possible weight is within two standard deviations. Again, the least possible weight would be like 0 0.00000001, basically zero at this point, even though zero would be impossible for the weight of a, a rabbit, but it could be close. So hopefully that makes sense to why it's skewed right. Now, why does that instantly make E wrong? Because when you're skewed to the right, the mean is higher than the median. The mean's going to be higher than the median. So E would be correct if it said the median was lower than the mean, but that's not what it says, unfortunately. So it's a pretty good problem. A lot of thinking goes into that one, so hopefully that made sense. And I'll be honest, a lot of kids have gotten that one wrong when they took this exam, so you know, hopefully um, I did a good job explaining. All right, this next one's a really easy question. It says, which of the following histograms is a shape that's approximately uniform? Well, hopefully you're, you're pretty good at your shapes. So uh, C here is skewed to the left. Uh, e is skewed to the right. 
Uh, B and D are both symmetric, but B is unimodal with that peak in the middle, where D is bimodal. And then A is, of course, our uniform. Uniform means that across the board, all of your bins, all of your frequencies, all of your counts are, are roughly equivalent here. They're roughly the same. They don't have to be exactly the same, but roughly the same. It's uniform. So choice A there. All right, and our final question here says, for a certain population of penguins, the distribution of weights is approximately normal with a mean of 15.1 kilograms and a standard deviation of 2.2 kilograms. So right away, I'm going to write that down. This is 15.1 is the mean and the standard deviation is 2.2 for this population of penguins. And it is normal, which makes me really happy. All right, approximately what percent of the penguins are from 30, 13 kilograms to 16.5 kilograms? So if I think about the random variable P, representing the weight of a penguin, I'm asked to find the probability that that weight is somewhere between 13.0 and 16.5. Now, if it wasn't normal, I unfortunately would not be able to answer this question with this given information, but because it's normal, I could do it. All we got to do is get the z-score. So we got to get the z-score for 13 by subtracting the mean of 15.1 divided by the standard deviation of 2.2. And grab a calculator because that's not one that you'd probably be able to do in your head, but that z-score is negative 0.955. Then we got to get the z-score for 16.5, the other end of our interval, and subtract 15.1, divide by the standard deviation of 2.2, and we get a z-score of 0.636. So trying to find the probability that a penguin is in between 13 and 16.5 kilograms would be equivalent to using the normal standard model and looking between a z-score of negative 0.955 and positive 0.636. Now to do that, I'm going to grab my calculator because that's, you know, you could use those normal z-tables, but, um, you know, we have technology. It makes it a little bit quicker and easier. You don't have to look it up. So I'm going to go ahead and hit second vars here. I'm going to go ahead and grab normal CDF. And I'm going to go from a lower value of negative 0.955 to an upper value of 0.636, and I'm going to leave the mean at zero and the standard deviation at one. That's using the standard normal model. So I'm basically looking in between these two z-scores, and I get a probability or a percentage, excuse me, percentage of about 57%, 56.8%, but of these choices, I'll round into the nearest whole number. C is going to be the one that is correct. All right, so hopefully um, walking through these questions was beneficial to you. And again, you're not going to see these exact same questions on the test, but you are going to see all these exact same concepts on the test. So just watching me and hearing me going over these problems is going to really benefit you because it's going to help remind you of all these concepts and see how they are used in problems. That way, when you take the test in May, you'll certainly be ready for it. All right, see you in the next video.